So for most of this year so far and part of last year as well, I've been fortunate enough to be able to implement the ideas presented in the four hour work week uh, in my own life. And basically I've been able to work four to five to maybe six hours a week um, while earning a really good income from my Amazon FBA business. So this video is just my personal experience, my account of what I've done, um, my pathway through the four hour work week. And you know, I'll tell you about how I achieved it as well. And one more thing, by the way, this isn't a book review. I've personally never read the four hour work week, but I have internalized the principles, which I'm familiar with, um, implemented it into my business and basically lived the four hour work week for the last eight or so months. Um, so it's not a book review, just my personal experience doing the four hour work week. So how did I achieve the four hour work week in the first place? Now, this channel, like I said, is Amazon FBA. That's the business model that I use to get to the four hour work week. If you want to know more about the specific bits and pieces in, in, in an Amazon FBA business, subscribe to the channel, watch all my videos. But the overall overarching theme that has to go on top of whatever Amazon FBA products you choose to sell or brands you choose to create, you need to think in terms of systems, you need to think in terms of processes. And I mean, if you don't go into Amazon FBA, I guess you need to think about actually having a scalable business model as well. As far as selling any type of product or service goes, Amazon FBA is a fantastic business model because most of the things that are hard and most of the things that are hard to replicate and to scale up and then to be able to go hands off from, most of those things are done for you by other parties. And Amazon is the biggest one, of course. Amazon is the traffic source. Amazon gives you customers who are literally ready to just click buy and buy your products. Um, that's why you get really high conversion rates on Amazon. Um, and that's why you have so much traffic and you can just use Amazon's internal marketing, um, pay-per-click advertising to drive that traffic straight away. It's really, really easy. Um, it's all done for you there. Uh, same with the logistics. Amazon does most of the logistics for you. You don't have to worry about the customer side. So that's all like already hands off. And if you've been looking at Amazon and FBA, for example, as your first business model and you are new to the world of business, you probably take that for granted and you probably don't realize how amazing that is. And just to put this into perspective, that opportunity that you could do this from your home and go online and then you know find a product to sell and then just get another company to do it all for you. You know, like 15 years ago, 30 years ago, a generation ago, basically, that would just blow people's minds. It was unheard of. And now we just take it for granted. But the fact is that that those reasons Amazon make it so, so scalable. So that was one of the reasons why I chose to go into Amazon FBA was with the idea of being able to uh, do what I'm doing now, which is to travel around the world, to have a hands-off business, that doesn't require me to physically be doing anything. And that's not a uh, sufficient condition for the four hour work week, but it is a necessary condition. If you can't get hands off from whatever business it is that you have, for example, if you have a restaurant or something and you're the one managing the restaurant, you can't have a four hour work week because you've got to be there every time the restaurant's open if you want to make money. So it's just like having a job. Um, but then, anyway, Amazon FBA, really good for that. But I want to talk about the overarching theme that even if you are selling on Amazon, you need to think in terms of systems and processes. And I also want to say as well that you need to think in terms of building up. You don't need to scale to the moon. You don't need to have a seven or an eight figure business to be able to do this, but you need sufficient scale so that you can start firstly mitigating risks and secondly, actually being able to pay people to do the work for you. If you just have one product, firstly, it might be pretty hands off because there's not that much to do once you have a product up and running. Once you've done the ranking, you've got the initial reviews, the product's running, as long as it's not too competitive, it does kind of just run by itself until it doesn't. And then you have to deal with problems like, uh, you know, listing suspensions. A lot of new sellers have account suspension issues, things like that. You, if you have no other scale, if you don't have other products or other sources of revenue, or at least enough revenue coming in that you can actually get somebody to solve those problems for you, you're just gonna be sitting there waiting for those problems to arise. And then when they arise, you have no infrastructure or systems or processes in place to be able to deal with them. And I see a lot of new sellers that are in that position where they're making good money and it maybe seems passive for a while. And then something happens that makes that income no longer passive. And every time that one of those things happens, which it does inevitably, it happens in my business, it happens in every single business. Um, but the difference is that if you don't have enough scale yet to be able to actually get somebody to come in and be like, all right, you like, here's how you deal with these problems. Now, next time it happens, you deal with it. If you don't, if you don't have the scale to be able to get to that point, then you will always be running and, and fighting those fires yourself. So scale is one thing and then systems and processes are the other two things. So here are some of the things that I thought about 
to build up my business to the point where I could step back and let still let those things happen that always happen in the Amazon ecosystem, like listings getting shut down uh, or suspended or account issues or uh, product quality issues with suppliers and shipments and things like that. All of that happens. It still happens to me just like it does to other, other sellers, but I have systems, processes, and people in place to run those systems and processes so that generally I don't have to do anything. So first of all, these things need to happen to you at least once. And then one, when that thing happens, every problem that you encounter or everything that you do once in your business, if it's gonna be something that you could encounter again in the future, just make sure you write down firstly notes and then secondly, step-by-step -step instructions for how to solve that problem. And of course, this means again, coming back to the scale, until these things happen to you, you don't have instructions. If you don't have instructions, you don't have a procedure, you don't have a process, so you can't build a system to solve the problem. But you only need to encounter these things once. And I want you to think about this if you already have some sort of business or you're independently generating any source of income. Think about your last week of working and think about the percentage of time that you spent following your own instructions. And I can almost guarantee that if you are looking at the four hour work week as something that's maybe really hard to attain or unobtainable, the proportion of time that you have spent in the last week following your own instructions is gonna be really low. You have just been working without actually thinking about what are the processes that you are really doing. Um, because the fact of the matter is that most businesses are really simple. If you can break them down to the simple component parts, then you will have a system of like step-by-step -step instructions from step one to step 10 or step 20 or however many steps it takes, really simple little tasks. Um, and so that was what I did with my Amazon FBA business was made sure that if I did something, maybe not once, but maybe the second time round for sure, that's when I started writing these instructions for myself. And so when I had enough scale, when I had enough products, which wasn't that many, it was maybe five, five or six products or something like that, I already had all these instructions. And so it was just a matter of going and finding a VA who you can hire for $3 an hour, $5 an hour. You can pay more than that if you want to, but that's all it really takes. You go and find that VA and you already have everything written down that you've been doing. And maybe that's not your entire job or your entire business is not written down that way, but you will have bits and pieces, or at least I did, um, that when I found a VA, I could give them those written instructions and just get them to do it. And it definitely wasn't about finding someone who was better than me at doing those tasks, but more so if you do the maths of like, okay, so I'm paying this person $5 an hour um, and maybe it takes them twice as long to do the same task as me. But all that means is if my time is worth more than $10 an hour, which is $5 an hour times two, if my time is worth more than that, or I could be doing things in the business that are worth more than that, or in terms of the four hour work week, if I could be doing things in my life outside of my business that I value at more than $10 an hour, then that VA is worth the money. And so I don't care if it takes two hours for them to do a one hour task, they can do it. They can do it and I can either grow my business or I can live my life. So that was like the realization that I came to um, very early on was that that math almost always works out because you know we've got Amazon to, to scale and to bring us our customers and then ship the products to them, which makes all of that really easy. And then we have this like crazy ability to go out and find people to work for us because we can go on upwork.com, onlinejobs.ph. I've hired people through Reddit before. Um, you just have all of these free websites basically where you can find people to work for, I mean, relatively cheaply. So one other trick that I learned while doing this and sort of building this up and getting this VA to do stuff for me um, was to track my time that I was working and not just track it, but categorize it. And you can do this either into two categories or three categories. It, do it doesn't really matter too much, but the first one is gonna be like working in the business or operating the business. And that's gonna be most of the things that you're doing when you start. It's actually, it's gonna be everything when you start is gonna be operating the business. Um, and then the second layer, if you choose to go three layers, is managing the business. And so that's gonna be like managing your VA to do things basically. And the highest layer or the, the level that you want to be at most of the time is designing the business or building the business. And these are the things where you're not doing the work. All you're doing is writing those instructions down or you're thinking about what the instructions should be or you're trying something new and then you're going to go and write the instructions down. That's building the business because then you're thinking about the structure, again, the systems and the processes of what it should all look like. So what I did was I used a tool called Toggle um, and I started recording all my hours and I would categorize all of those hours into, I actually only used the two. So I didn't have managing, I just had working in the business and building the business. And what you wanna be doing 
or what I did anyway that worked for me was to make sure that the percentage of time you spent building the business versus working in the business, that percentage of building needs to go up over time. So at the start, you don't know what you're doing, you're just working, fine, but like, as I said, you're writing those instructions down and and, and, and getting someone else to, to follow these instructions, but you should be spending more and more of your time writing instructions and building processes instead of doing the work. Another way that I was thinking about this was like, if I spent 99% of my time working in the business, basically, <laughs> I'm basically working a job, which is again, trading time for money. And so then of course, how am I gonna reach like escape velocity and get out of that cycle? So I had to force myself to spend time just building instructions and then paying people to follow them and accepting as well that they weren't gonna follow them exactly or they weren't gonna follow them super efficiently or as good as I could do it, but it didn't matter because again, with that multiple, as long as my time is worth you know, roughly, let's say twice as much as theirs, or I valued my time like that, then I was winning. And then I could spend more time building more processes and procedures. And then eventually you don't need to build more processes and procedures. And that's when you start getting towards the four hour work week. And I mean, that's pretty much how I achieved the four hour work week. I can provide a, a couple of examples, again, Amazon FBA specific, but let's say you're doing product research. And when you're looking at Amazon or however it is that you are finding new products to sell, there is a thought process behind that. Whether you're conscious of it or whether you're unconscious of it, there are a series of simple questions like yes, no type questions, uh, answers, sorry, or maybe some criteria or some metrics that you're using, if you've already got a product that is, when you look on Amazon or wherever it is that you're finding new products from. All you need to do is reflect a little bit, and look inside your mind and see what those questions that you're asking yourself are and what your answers are and just write them down. Um, because if you can break it down, into conscious level thinking, then you can give that stuff to somebody else to do. It doesn't have to be you. You will want to make the decisions and like basically someone will go and get the raw data for you, for example, and then you might make the final call. But if you can't explain what is going on in your head, or another example would be Amazon PPC. If you don't actually have a step-by-step -step process for how you optimize and manage your Amazon PPC campaigns, the problem isn't that you don't know how to hire people. The problem is that you don't actually know what you're doing in the first place. And you won't be able to achieve the next level, which is the four hour work week, if you haven't figured that step out. And so if it feels like when you go on to, cam uh, to campaign manager, if it feels like you're just mucking around and just like playing with stuff, it's because you are and you need to stop doing that and work out what the system is, what the process is. It might not be perfect. It might not be, you know, 100% the best process ever, but as long as you have one, then you can outsource it to somebody else. And again, it's not about it's not about being perfect. It's just about getting it down on paper, getting it done, figuring out what you're actually doing, what you're thinking about. And once you figure that out, somebody else can do it for five to 10, maybe $15 an hour, depending on how skilled it is. But it's really a lot less than, I mean, ideally what your time should be worth. And it's probably a lot less than what you expect it to be as well. So what happened when I achieved the four hour work week? And what has happened in the last eight months? I'm gonna talk about the good and the bad side of living the four hour work week. So first of all, the good. I am literally sailing around the world because of this, because of the four hour work week, because of Amazon FBA, without being able to rely on systems processes uh, and, and people to run those, to do that for me, there is no way in hell that I would be doing anything other than just being the guy working in my business. Like, yeah, I might be making seven figures working for it all, but I would still be day in, day out, thinking about it and stressing about it and, and just worrying about it and grinding basically. And right now I have reflected on this a lot and I'm really conscious of the fact that what is absolute craziness, which is the fact that I you know own a catamaran in the Caribbean and that's where I live and I get to sail and do these crazy things that I realistically thought I would never be able to do while making more money than I've ever made before, while working less than I ever really expected to work and doing all of this at the same time. And this craziness is like, it's like a dream come true. It is literally a dream come true, <laughs> but it normalizes. It actually gets normal really quickly. So I actually have to dig really deep and make sure to stay in touch with that appreciation of that because it does it does start to feel normal really quickly. And I mean, it's, it's not. It, the fact is that that is not normal to become a millionaire while doing all of this stuff um, and you know be on my way to a multimillionaire mark it just doesn't feel fair. But at the same time, um, you know, it is what it is, it is reality. And I, and I know as well that if I was still stuck on that treadmill, if I was still working full time, 
And if I had not been able to focus on the systems and the processes to get to that four hour work week level, I, I, I mean, at least one or two of these things wouldn't be happening for me right now. So I'm, I'm blessed with that luxury. And, and really that's a result of having this four hour work week is being able to fit all these things into my life at the same time. And again, this goes back to the part where Tim talks about filling the void, which is if your income stays here, but your hours go down, what do you do with all that extra time? And for me personally, it definitely hasn't been about uh, just relaxing and not doing much and sort of like being on a holiday all the time. It's been about filling that time with other things like this YouTube channel, like sailing, um, like, like learning new things, like reading, like discovering myself and reflecting myself more than I was able to do before. Or in other words, being very purposeful about being able to choose things that are gonna add more value to your life than just working for the sake of working. Another really good thing about achieving the four hour work week and living it for a while was the fact that in order to be able to get to that point, I had to hire people. And in the process of hiring people and having people work for me, I realized how rewarding that experience can be in and of itself. Now I am the stereotypical lone wolf entrepreneur. When I think of hustling or I think of building a business or generating an online income, I picture me sitting in front of a computer by myself, probably in a dark room, doing that for a long period of time. And basically I'm just in my own world when I, when I picture that. And that's how I started. But in order to be able to get out of that and to actually do all of this, I had to hire people. I had to get out of that bubble. I had to build a small team, not a big team, but a small team. And, and to do that, then you realize there's all of these other beautiful challenges involved, which is like get, getting along with people, motivating people. And that's actually been one of the hidden uh, gems of doing this whole thing is, is learning how rewarding that can be, particularly as a lone wolf entrepreneur. And other than that, another thing that I'm super grateful for is to be able to have this channel and produce this content, make these videos, to talk to you guys in the comments down below, um, to receive all of your likes, which if you haven't done so, smash the like button. Uh, but I get a lot of value out of this and building these relationships and hopefully having an impact, a positive impact on somebody. And so other than that, apart from the sailing, I have really discovered that there are a whole lot of things that I used to like doing that I stopped doing because firstly, I, I guess I you know, changed priorities. I started looking at work and building a career. And then when I got into the career, which was mining engineering, I discovered that I didn't like it. And then a lot of my free time, rather than being this like pleasurable, uh, activity for learning and stuff and, and continuing to improve myself, my free time outside of my old job was just like an escape, an escape from the harsh reality that I was living, I suppose. Uh, and so I sort of found myself consuming a lot more, wasting a lot more time. But having had this now, this like sort of four hour work week time where I'm satisfied and I, I don't feel the need to escape from any reality, I've gotten back into reading a lot. One of my goals this year was to read a book a week every single week for the whole year. I'm on track with that. So I've read nearly 30 books this year and it's just been a lot of fun learning about all these things and, and taking a more proactive approach to learning as well. And then other than the actual sailing, we are also making videos about what we're doing and that's been so fun sort of getting back into my creative side. I used to be really into photography um, and then that got pushed to the side so that I could start hustling and start building a business. If you wanna follow along our videos and our adventures, um, check out the channel. I'll, I'll leave a link somewhere. It'll be one of the links in the description and it'll probably pop up here as well, I think. Now, there isn't much on the channel yet, but there will be, I promise. So if you like some of this footage that you're seeing, um, then go click there and subscribe and I'll see you on that channel as well. But really all of this stuff that's been filling this void that could have taken place when I started the four hour work week, whether you call this work or not, to me, from where I'm sitting now, it's all just a matter of perspective and it doesn't really matter whether it's work or not. They're all just things that I actually want to be doing. And sometimes I'm not able to do the things that I wanna do. And maybe the flip side is that now I'm really conscious of that. And if I get forced to do something temporarily that is not you know, something that adds value to my life, uh, it's, it's actually really hard to do that. If I have to talk to somebody who I don't wanna to talk to or be around you know, somebody like, all that stuff is getting harder. So it's both a good thing and a bad thing. But overall, in terms of the good, I never really hit that void that, that Tim described. I never really fell into the trap of, you know, having this vacuum of meaningful things. I was always conscious about it. So for the last eight months, really the good has been filling all that time with the things that really do matter and discovering more about that, what, what does matter to me for myself.
Okay, so how about the bad side of the four hour work week? First of all, first thing that comes to mind, most people don't get it. And as you get to this stage, depending on the amount of income that you have, um, but definitely with the amount of free time that you have, the people that you can surround yourself with that understand the way that you think and the way that you do things and the way that you approach your life and what you put into it and how conscious you are of that, you will relate to less and less people around you. You will have friends that no longer understand who you are. You may no longer understand your friends um, and that can cause friction, it can cause distances, it can break apart relationships, um, even simple things. It doesn't have to be really bad. It doesn't have to be these like huge consequences like I just said, um, but like people don't really get it. And like family, for example, will ask like, well, how, you know, what are you doing with all your time? Like, is your business, has it failed? Are you still doing that? And it's like, yeah, the answer is, yeah, I mean, it's still making money, but I'm not, I'm not doing much to it. It's just like, I don't have to work right now. That's something that I'm coming to terms with because you'll find that there aren't that many people around who have that amount of flexibility and that amount of freedom, plus the income to be able to do the things that, you know, that, that they want to do or that you want to do and to be able to do them together. So that's definitely a bad thing is, is finding those people. Um, the other things that I wanted to talk about are more business specific. So what happens when you step away from your business? And now I'm gonna talk about Amazon, but it's not all good. It's not all a rosy picture at all. I think this really does depend on the type of business you have or the type of brands you have, how entrenched you are in the marketplace and how automated you've got it as well. But I'm gonna say from my perspective that nothing is set in stone. I'm seeing that things really do change very quickly. Tim wrote the four hour work week uh, more than 10 years ago now. And I know a lot has changed in that time. And I personally feel like things are just accelerating. The, the rate of change is getting faster over time, which means if you expect that your, even your systems and your processes and the people that you have working those systems and processes, if you expect that system itself to be stable over time, I think that's getting more and more difficult to actually achieve as time goes on, as we just get into this, this crazy rate of change in this modern world that we live in. So whatever business you have, try and think about how long do you actually think it will stay stable? How long do you actually think you will be able to grow passively? For example, if you step away, if you only put in four hours a week or one hour a day or whatever small amount of time, how long do you think that will last? Whether it's the platforms that your business relies on, it could be Amazon, it could be Facebook advertising, it could be Google SEO, or it's new competition appearing in your marketplace and those competitors are working, they're not sitting back, letting their business just glide along. Uh, whether it's you know changing market preferences, whether it's different trends or new products that come in that are uh, better than the ones that you're selling or better services. Maybe maybe it so happens that you know whatever you're selling was popular and now it's just not that popular anymore or the trend changes or basically time passes and everything that you built, everything you set up doesn't pass or move fast enough to catch up with. And honestly, speaking from my own personal experience again, Amazon, selling products on Amazon is on the bad end of the spectrum for that. And then the next thing is like, okay, so you've got some stuff automated, some processes running, you know, people are doing work for you, but unless everything is automated, one of the sort of hidden risks now is that you have people doing the work for you. And so then you have to start asking yourself like, what happens if that person steps out? Or what happens if they get demotivated? What happens if the vision that you were providing when you were the business owner working in your business what if that vision then stops meaning anything to them? Or what if it falls apart? Or if you get to that point where you're not working very much, as soon as you lock yourself into that mindset or that goal or the objective of staying there and, and you know thinking that I'm earning passive income, therefore I'm the best, therefore I don't need to work ever again, that's when these bad times, these bad things start to accumulate. That's when the, all of the hard work that you've done to build something, that's when all of that start that hard work can start to unravel and it can start to fall apart around you. And when you think about it, this makes complete sense. Can you imagine if you were working for somebody else and their only goal, and you knew this, their only goal was to just never work and to not do any work at all. And you knew that you working for them, if you ever had problems or you needed support or there were really like challenges, tough times, you knew that they didn't care and they didn't wanna be a part of it and they were just trying to achieve this four hour work week. Or let's say instead of being the, the the VA or the assistant or whatever for this person with the four hour work week, let's say you're the customer and let's say it's products or services, it doesn't really matter. And when you have an issue with your product or your service or it's not up to spec, 
you know that that owner, they are just absent and they don't care and they're just trying to make money while doing no work at all. Think about what you would do as either the employee or as the customer. I can almost guarantee you that if that business owner has competition and that competition isn't doing the four hour work week and they are working and they actually care about something other than not working, then they are gonna step in and they're gonna be able to deliver a better product, they're gonna be able to deliver a better service, they're gonna be more caring, they're gonna be able to pay their employees more, do all that sort of stuff. And that is exactly how you lose to your competition, you lose market share, you start to lose income and your business starts to fall apart. So that's why I don't think this is sustainable and I don't think for the long term, I don't think it's good to have it as a vision or something to strive for. You will just end up falling short somewhere along the way. And, and I feel like I've come close to that. And the reality is that you can hire somebody who is cheaper than you. You can hire somebody who maybe at certain things is better than you are. But at the end of the day, you will never find somebody who cares more about your business than you do. If you are the owner, if you created this thing, your baby, no one's ever gonna care about it. No one's ever gonna have the vision that you have for it. And that means they're not gonna work as hard as you work. They're not gonna be motivated as, as, as easily as you are. They're not gonna think about things as intelligently as you do because you simply care more. That's one reason. And here's the other reason, money. It's a very practical reason, but it's something that you still need to think about. Unless your four hour work week plan literally extends from today until the day that you die, you still need money to live, to survive, to do the things that you wanna do, uh, to maybe have a family, to care for people, whatever it is, money is always going to be some sort of an issue. And I'm not even talking about the income that you earn year to year from your business, whether it's passive or active or semi-passive or whatever. I'm talking about the value of the business itself, the sale multiple. And that's basically how much your business is worth, which is a multiple of your annual earnings of, you know, for an Amazon business, it's pretty low compared to other businesses. It might be two, it might be three. If you're doing really well, you can push it above three times your annual net profit. But what I've been thinking about recently is if I zoom out and I look at my life and my business as a vehicle and an objective to, to really enable me to do these things, not just right now, passively, not just to live this life that I want to live today or this year or even the next year, but long term for forever, for my family. I see this vehicle, this Amazon business as a way to do that potentially forever, um, but not if I'm selling myself short by focusing on the passive income today at the expense of all the income that could come later on. And here's the thing that isn't really talked about very often, and especially not with Amazon FBA businesses. In my opinion, a business isn't really a business unless you can actually sell it to somebody else. Not the product that you sell, the actual business itself. If, if, if it's not an asset, if you can't sell it, it's not a business, it's a job. You still just have a job. But if you can make it into a good business that is sellable for a multiple of your, you know, your yearly earnings, then if you can think about increasing the value of that business, not in terms of the annual income, but in terms of increasing the multiple, which means making the business more sustainable, which means, you know, for example, taking your brands off of Amazon or growing it into something, building up a customer audience base, people who actually really like know and love your products, then you can increase that multiple. And if you increase the multiple by one, then you effectively just saved yourself a year's worth of work. And again, going back to what I see as the key point of the four hour work week, it's not about just doing nothing or taking a holiday. It's about leveraging your time in the most valuable, most effective way for you. But more importantly, those activities, the, the work and improvements you'd need to make to your Amazon FBA business to increase the sale multiple from two times your annual earnings to three times, or say from three times to four times, the things that would make that business from a three times to a four times business are the things that actually matter. That's the work that I really wanna do. That's the satisfying work that I hesitate to call work because I actually enjoy it. I enjoy the challenge, I enjoy what it stands for, and I enjoy the feeling and the flow of doing that and, and of standing up to that challenge. That's taking the business from just a bunch of random products, for example, to a brand that actually means something to you. That's taking the business from not having any audience to actually having people who really do truly care about the things that you're creating, the things that you're making and you're selling on Amazon. That means building something that is, again, not just this like money-making machine, but it's actually something meaningful that adds value, not just to you, but to the lives uh, of your team members, of their families. It adds value to the lives of your customers and their families. And, and you can just see this huge spider web now of net positive impact on the world. So that's something that is really appealing to me. And it is a lot more appealing, to be honest, than the idea of just artificially maintaining this four hour work week, minimizing my hours, maximizing my dollars per hour. It's been fun, but it doesn't mean enough to me. So 
this is what I'll be working on for the next six months is putting work into my business to make it grow, to make it mean more, to increase as well, increase the sale multiple so that it means more to me financially and non-financially because that's something that I think is worth doing. So that's really it. That's what I learned doing the four hour work week for the last eight months. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want a step-by-step -step breakdown of everything, firstly, that I did to get up to the four hour work week and then everything that I did to be able to maintain the four hour work week, and you want a good inside peek at what I will be doing for the rest of this year and into next year, make sure to check out my Amazon FBA training. It's gonna be the first link in the description down below. Other than that, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already done so. And if you wanna know more about the actual process of how I built that business in more specific details, talking about product research, all that sort of stuff, check out my story of how I became a millionaire in under three years. Again, that was via Amazon FBA. Well, that's gonna be here, I think, I hope. Anyway, check out the video. I'll see you there. Peace.